Amen. Well, good morning once again, New Heritage Church. To our guests again, we say welcome. Um, there, there are many questions in life that whenever they are asked, they invoke a, a really wide um, array of responses. For example, why are we here? Uh, what is my purpose, right? What, what would God have me do in life? And these are just a few, but another example of one of these questions and one that we will seek to answer uh, this morning is this. Why did Jesus come? What was his purpose? What was his mission? And make no mistake about it, there are many correct answers to this question. We find one in Mark 10, which we looked at briefly last week, where Jesus said in verse 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And another is found in John 6, verse 38, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And there are several more passages where Jesus explicitly states a reason or a purpose for his coming. But perhaps none more so than in our text this morning as we arrive at the beginning of the 19th chapter of Luke's gospel. Um, in Luke 19.10, which we're going to look at, Jesus tells us explicitly, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That is a purpose. That is a mission. Uh, Paul echoed a similar thing in, in 1 Timothy 1.15 when he said, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Well, this morning we are going to examine a very familiar story. And, and uh, we're going to look at an interaction between Jesus and a man called Zacchaeus. Or Zacchaeus, however you want to say it. And what we will see ultimately is that Jesus' mission to find and to save uh, sinners, lost sinners, was in play and effective well before Paul ever penned those words in 1 Timothy 15. And we're actually going to see that in play in our text this morning. So if you would, if you're in Luke 19, would you please stand with me as we honor the public reading of God's Word? And if you're visiting, the text should be in your bulletin there. Um, but the Word of God says in Luke 19, verse 1, he entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Let's pray. Father, again, we just pray that you would bless this hour. God, that our worship would be uh, acceptable in your sight and pleasing to you, Lord. May we uh, put away all distractions now and just fix um, our hearts and our minds on you. Father, you are uh, the treasure of our hearts. And Lord, may we reflect that this morning. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, please be seated. Well, if you remember last week, we looked at the story of Jesus healing a blind beggar named Bartimaeus. And the place where this healing occurred was right outside of Jericho. Uh, verse 35 of chapter 18 says, as he drew near to Jericho. So the healing of Bartimaeus occurs on their way in. Well, here in verse 1, we read, if I turn my page back to verse 1, he entered Jericho and was passing through. So at this point, Jesus and the boys are in the city on their way to Jerusalem, and they've just added another member to their party. Because if you remember, verse 43 last week told us that after being healed, Bartimaeus followed him. Uh, he became a disciple of Jesus Christ. So Jesus and his disciples are traveling through the city of Jericho. And look there in verse 2. It says, And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. Well, here in verse 2, we are introduced to Zacchaeus. And now what's kind of ironic about this whole thing is that the name Zacchaeus itself actually means pure or innocent. And the reason that's ironic is because whenever we're introduced to him here, we're told that he's a chief tax collector, which essentially means that he would have been viewed as an absolute scumbag. Uh, he was the last person anyone in his day would have considered pure or innocent. As you guys well know, tax collectors were considered to be kind of that lowest rung of Jewish society because they were sellouts and traitors to their own people. Uh, Jordan touched on this in his sermon a few weeks ago, but tax collectors typically traveled around with a band of Roman soldiers with them, and they would use that muscle, these, these Roman soldiers, to um, 
to extort money from their fellow Jews. You see, every tax collector had a contract with Rome, and it had a set dollar amount that they had to collect in taxes and pay back to Rome. Um, it, that was demanded of them, but anything they could take in above that number was theirs to keep. Um, it was theirs, and, and I've said this before, but this entire tax system was more or less set up to function like the mafia. Um, you, you, pay, you pay up or we break your legs. Um, well, Zacchaeus wasn't just a tax collector, because that's how all of them functioned, right? But we see that he was a chief tax collector. Uh, I taught this lesson to the kids Wednesday night, and my nephew Abel was in there. I think he's six. Um, and I asked him, I said, who knows what a chief means? And he said, I think it's like the president. I was like, that's, that's a pretty good description. He, he's kind of like a president uh, tax collector. But what it means being the chief tax collector is that he was in charge of all the local tax collectors within a specific region. So I would liken this to kind of like a district manager. You know, he's a guy that's got a bunch that are underneath him. Well, according to Gerhard Kittel, if I'm saying that right, in the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, he says that taxes were collected three places inland. You had Capernaum, Jericho, and Jerusalem. Well, here we find that Zacchaeus had one of the big three. He is a chief tax collector, and he is in Jericho. So in other words, he had it made. Uh, Zacchaeus, in terms of finances, he was a very, very wealthy man, extremely wealthy. But think about this. In terms of his status, to, to get where he was, to, to come out of this sea of, of tax collectors and become the chief, that was not a small feat. Uh, what, what this would have required, what it would have taken, was someone who was willing to lie, cheat, and steal. Someone who was completely remorseless and morally bankrupt. Now, Zacchaeus also would have been absolutely hated by pretty much everybody. Now, we're going to learn in the next verse that physically he was a small man. But according to Robert Kent Hughes, he says, In the eyes of his countrymen, his littleness was more than physical. He was a despised nobody. So, corrupt to the core, filthy rich, most likely mean as a snake, and probably extremely lonely. Um, the kind of man who had everything the world could offer and yet probably felt completely alone in a crowded room. Uh, this is the man that's before us in our story today. And this is the last person any of us, if we're being honest, would ever expect to make it into the kingdom of God. Uh, the odds are not in his favor. But look there at verse 3. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. Now, what we learn here in verse 3 is that Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus. Now, the question that we need to ask is why? Why does he want to see Jesus? He, he's getting ready to, uh, to do something a little extreme. We're going to look at that in the next verse to get a glimpse of Jesus. But again, the question is why? Is it because word had already traveled about what just happened on their way into town about healing Bartimaeus? Is it because he heard about that and he wants to see the man uh, that was responsible for it? Was it simply because, like we talked about last week, Jesus was famous at this point in his ministry. Uh, Jesus was a household name. He, people knew who he was. So is that why he wanted to see him? You know, one thing to consider is that because he was a chief tax collector, that means that he probably knew Matthew Levi personally. Um, turn back with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 5. Let's look at something in Luke 5. There in verse 27. It says, After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. So what we learn there in, in Luke 5, verse 27, is that Levi, who we also know today as Matthew, he was a tax collector. Now, being as hated as they were, as this group was, tax collectors didn't really have very many friends, if any at all, outside of other tax collectors and other sinners, right? Uh, prostitutes, thieves, the, the detestable of society. These were their acquaintances. Well, look at verses 28 and 29. It says, And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with him. So after Levi's called, he throws a party. And who are some of his guests? It says a large company of tax collectors. Uh, that means there was a bunch of them. Is it possible that Zacchaeus himself was at this party? Absolutely. We can't rule that out. It absolutely is possible, but he may not have been. Um, either way, though, it's very likely that he would have heard about it, being in his position, especially if one of, you know, one of the other tax collectors just up and quit. And consider this. What if Zacchaeus had bumped into Matthew after that at some point between then and our text this morning? What if he had seen with his own eyes the radical difference in Matthew's life? 
Imagine for a wealthy man like Zacchaeus how hard it would be to fathom Matthew giving up this lifestyle to follow this Jesus guy. Remember that as a tax collector, uh, Matthew would have been very rich too, but, but Jesus called him from his tax booth and he never went back. Matthew completely yielded his status and his wealth and so on. And I say all that to say that it's very likely that Zacchaeus had heard of Jesus long ago. That's very likely. But all we know for sure is what the text tells us, which is he was seeking to see who Jesus was. Now look at the rest of that verse. It says, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. Um, so, so the guy wants to see Jesus, but he's so short that he can't see over the crowd in front of him. Now I'm, got, I'm not going to chase that rabbit, but I can relate to that a little bit. All right, been there, done that. But in any case, what is he to do? Because he's determined to see the Christ, but he knows that these crowds are going to follow Jesus. They're going to stay with him. So if he doesn't come up with some sort of solution, he's going to miss his opportunity. Well, look there at verse 4. After I go back to Luke 19. Here we go. Verse 4 says, So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. So Zacchaeus decides that the only way he's going to get to see Jesus is if he gets ahead of the crowd, if he beats them, right, and climbs this tree. And notice the first thing we're told there is that he ran on ahead. It says he ran on ahead. You know, back in Luke 15, we find the story of the prodigal son. And and one thing that always gets highlighted, and you guys know this, if you've ever heard anybody preach the prodigal son, what's always highlighted is the fact that the father ran to the son. And why is it that that is brought up every time? Well, it's because it's important, because in their culture, it was considered shameful for a man to run. Um, In order for a man to run, he would have had to hitch up his tunic, which would have exposed his bare legs. And for a man in that culture to expose his bare legs was considered extremely shameful. Uh, This was something to be embarrassed about. So it was a very abnormal thing to see a grown man running. But here in our text, that's exactly what we see Zacchaeus doing. He is running. And I think that really this is probably the first indication in this story of where his heart truly was at this point in time. Because what his running shows us is just how badly he wanted to see Jesus Christ. You see, he was willing to totally humiliate himself in front of what was no doubt a very large crowd just so he could get ahead and lay eyes on Jesus Christ. But it didn't stop there. Because not only did he run, but we're told also in verse 4 that he climbed a sycamore tree. So he ran to this tree, and then he climbs a tree. Well, guess how many other men we read of in the New Testament climbing trees? Uh, None, right? There's one, and and it's right here. Think about something, though. In our own lives, in our own day and age, who do we see typically running and climbing trees? Children, right? Children. This isn't even typical behavior for grown men in our day, uh, but back in their day, it was like completely unheard of. Now, some of y'all might be climbing trees. That wouldn't surprise me. But, you know, back in this day... Uh, it just wasn't, it wasn't a thing. That was embarrassing. Both of these things were shameful for men because both were considered to be childlike behavior. Well, if you recall, last week I made the point that blind Bartimaeus was calling out to Jesus with that childlike faith. Remember we talked about he came to him wholly reliant with nothing to offer in return. And Pastor Josh taught us from Luke 18 that, quote, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And I believe that by his running and climbing this tree, his childlike behavior, we get a glimpse at where this man's heart really is at this time. Uh, There are hints here, and we ought to take notice. He isn't just wanting to see Jesus so that he can put a face with a name, but he wanted to see Jesus because God was at work in his heart. He was drawing him to Christ, drawing him to salvation. In John 6, 44, we read, No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I believe that's what we see going on here. This is a sovereign work of God, which we're going to see more clearly as we continue along. But in any case, so we see here that he runs down the path and he climbs up in this tree, probably hiding in the tree, probably not wanting to be seen more. And and here he comes. Look at verse 5. It says, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So imagine the scene. Jesus is walking in front of this huge crowd down the streets of Jericho, probably teaching because that was normal for a rabbi. He would teach as they walked, and then suddenly Jesus stops. And suddenly these, all this crowd around him stops, and they're probably scratching their head like, what are we doing here? And then seemingly to the air in front of him, Jesus calls out and commands Zacchaeus to come down. 
Can you imagine the confusion in the minds of these people? They're like, maybe the heat's getting to him. I don't know. I don't know what he's talking about. But notice Jesus' words, because this was not a request. He didn't ask him, hey, Zacchaeus, if you feel like it, come down. This was a command. He says, hurry and come down. I'm reminded of Mark 4 where Jesus rebukes the storm. And he says, peace, be still. And what happened? Everything was calm. The storm obeyed. Jesus can command the elements and they obey. We talked about in Sunday school this morning, Jesus can also command the dead. In John 11, Jesus calls out to Lazarus who had been dead for four days. Lazarus, come out. And verse 44 says, the man who had died came out. So Jesus commands the elements. He commands the dead. Well, here he commands Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus obeys. And he obeys because God has ordained this moment and this meeting from before the foundation of the world. He obeyed because he was part of the flock that Jesus spoke of in John 10 when he said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And we can see this is true by what Jesus says here. He says, I must, I must stay at your house today. This word for must is the Greek word die. It's spelled D-E-I, but it's pronounced die. I know that's backwards, but it's Greek. And what this word means is necessary. He's saying it is necessary that I stay at your house today. I must. I have to. It is essential. Now, Jericho was a prosperous place, so there's no doubt there was a lot of places, a lot of really nice places that he could have stayed. So he wasn't. it wasn't a necessity that he stay with Zacchaeus just for the sake of lodging. Um, why then was it necessary? Does anyone remember the story of the woman at the well in John 4? Uh, it, it opens up by saying that he, Jesus, had to pass through Samaria. Well, that word had is the same word here that's translated as, as must. It's the word die. Well, if you've ever studied that story, then you know that it wasn't necessary for them to go through Samaria because of the route they were traveling on. There were alternate routes they could have taken to avoid Samaria altogether. But Jesus had, he, it was necessary for him to go through Samaria because he knew that one of his wayward sheep was there. And he had to go through Samaria so that he could bring salvation to that Samaritan woman whom God had given him in eternity past. And this is exactly why he says that he must stay at Zacchaeus' house. He was coming to bring salvation to this man. This was a divinely ordained meeting, and so Jesus says it's necessary. And how does Zacchaeus respond? Look at verse 6. So he hurried and came down and received him begrudgingly, right? No, joyfully. Remember that uh, unless he had just ran so far ahead of this crowd that uh, he was completely away from them, it is highly likely that at least some of them saw him climb that tree. But, but once he was in that tree, as I've already mentioned, he would have been trying to hide. He would, have been, he would have wanted to protect himself from any further embarrassment. So here, as Jesus calls out to him, essentially exposing him, we might expect Zacchaeus to react a little differently. We, we may think that he might get so anxious that the leaves start shaking, right? Uh, or, or maybe he'll just play dead and pretend like Jesus is crazy and there's nobody up there. But our text says that he hurried and came down. He got down in a hurry and received him joyfully. And this right here is a normal response for those that meet Christ. And it is a great lesson for us today on the fear of man. Because what we see in Zacchaeus is that rather than dreading the climb down and being embarrassed, he gets down in a hurry and he does so with joy. And here's the point. He doesn't care what anybody in this crowd thinks about him anymore because he's getting to meet the Messiah. And not only is he getting to meet Jesus, but he's going to be lodging alongside them. Jesus said in John 15, 4, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. That word for abide, it means dwell. It means to stay there. Just like Zacchaeus would shortly be dwelling with the Christ, you and I as believers today are dwelling in the Christ and he in us. And what does that result in for him and what should it result in for us? Fruit. It should result in fruit. But we're not there yet. Let's go look at verse 7. It says, And when they saw it, they all grumbled, He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Now this is far from an unusual response. Multiple times in Luke's Gospel alone, we've read about these religious leaders grumbling because Jesus was associating with these, you know, quote-unquote lowlifes. Uh, you see, in their eyes, they were better. There were categories, and this is how they broke it down. There was us, the good guys, and then there were all these tax collectors and sinners and, you know, everybody that's not one of us. These are the bad guys over here. 
Think back to when Pastor Jordan preached a few weeks ago. Do you remember what the Pharisee prayed in that text? He said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. You see, he thought he was better. He thought he was above this man over here, and that became evident in his prayer. And it's the same thing we see in our text this morning. And what it boils down to ultimately is a, an elevated view of self, a high view of self. And a high view of self or, or thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to, it leads to blindness and deception. In other words, what that will do for us, if we think too highly of ourselves, it will either cause us to take our sin less serious or overlook it altogether. Paul spoke of this very thing in Galatians 6, 3, which Josh is going to get to one of these Wednesdays. But he says, for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So here's the reality, church. If we are downplaying or overlooking our sin altogether, then that necessitates that we are not repenting of it. You can't honestly be seeking to turn away from your sin if you're at the same time pretending like it isn't a big deal. Pretending like it doesn't exist because I'm not bad as this person over here. But that's what we see going on here in Luke. Zacchaeus realizes his sin and he is turning from it. Um, Zacchaeus was being hospitable to the Savior and at the same time the crowds were, were scolding them. They were scolding Jesus for being in there because they were completely blind to the darkness in their own hearts. They thought they were something. And there at the end of verse 7, we see that Jesus is now in the home of Zacchaeus and we don't know how much time has passed between verses 7 and verse 8. Um, verse 8 could have come immediately after or it could have come a little later on. And I tend to lead toward that second option, um, although the text doesn't tell us, so we really can't be dogmatic about it. But Jesus had, in, had instructed the disciples back in Luke 10, when he sent them out, he told them what to do when they're going from town to town evangelizing. And he essentially told them that if somebody receives you into their home, preach the gospel to them. Like, that's what the point is. So if they let you in, give them the good news. Tell them about the kingdom of God. So if he's telling the disciples to do that, it stands to reason that he's probably going to follow that pattern too. I, I don't expect that our Lord would operate much differently here in the home of Zacchaeus. Furthermore, Pastor Josh preached the story of the rich young ruler a couple weeks ago. And in that story, the man wanted eternal life, but he wanted to cling to his possessions more. But looking at Zacchaeus' response here in verse 8, I think it's a fair assumption that he and Jesus probably had a very similar conversation. Um, as the one that Jesus had with the rich young ruler. But the outcome of this one is totally different. Look at verse 8. It says, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. You know what we're seeing right here in this text? Genuine repentance. Sincere repentance. Zacchaeus is broken over his corruption and the way that he for so long has dealt with his countrymen. And so now he is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has a changed heart, and we see him seeking to make restitution. And the first pledge we see is that he's going to give up half his income. He says, half my goods I give to the poor. But he doesn't stop there. Now that's extreme in and of itself. How many of us would be like, yeah, half stuff I own, I'm giving it up, right? But he doesn't stop there. He wants to go well beyond that. And so he vows that if he has defrauded anyone... He's going to give them back times four. Now, when he says, if I've defrauded or if I've cheated anyone of anything, he's not making that statement as if he, like, he doesn't know or it's possible maybe he has or hasn't. That statement in the Greek is what's called a first-class condition. And what that means is that the premise of the statement is true. It is assumed to be true. So by saying, if I've defrauded anyone, he, he's saying that he has. He knows that he has. It's not a possibility in Zacchaeus' mind that he hasn't. So not only is he willing to pay back those he's cheated, but he's willing to give them back 400%. In Leviticus 6.5, we read what God prescribes regarding restitution. And it says this, Or anything about which he has sworn falsely, he shall restore it in full um, and shall add a fifth to it and give it to him whom it belongs on the day he realizes his guilt. So we see that in Leviticus. It's also in Numbers 5, verse 7. Same thing is echoed. But the point is that the law of God only required that he pay back what he owed plus 20%. That is uh, biblical restitution. But Zacchaeus is giving back 
well beyond the requirements of the law. And, and what I want you to understand through this is that by his pledging to give 50% to the poor, right, and then out of that other 50%, he's going to pay back fourfold. Everything that he's cheated somebody out of, he's essentially making a pledge here that he's going to give away everything he's got. That's what's going on here. And, and this is huge. Because again, this is a direct contrast between what we saw a couple weeks ago with the rich young ruler. You see, for so long, money had been Zacchaeus' God. Money and status uh, and all these perks that came along with it. But now that he had come to the Lord Jesus Christ, he was willing to smash his idol. He was willing to kill the false God in his heart, to knock his false God off his throne so that King Jesus could take supremacy there. And the giving away of his money, it didn't gain him salvation, but rather it was an evidence of it. It was an evidence that God had done a miraculous work in his heart. And how can we say for certain that he, would, he was saved that day? You might think, well, I don't believe you. How do you know that? Well, look at verse 9. It says, And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. Do you remember what Jesus said in chapter 18, verse 25? He said, For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Well, here in this story of Zacchaeus, we see that this rich man did, in fact, beat the odds. Uh, he did squeeze through that needle, if you will, and he made it into God's kingdom. Jesus says, today, salvation has come to this house. But lest we be, th we be tempted to think that Zacchaeus contributed anything to this salvation, we need to remember what came after verse 25 in Luke 18. Because in Luke 18, verses 26 and 27, it says, Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. You see, this salvation that was given to Zacchaeus was a sovereign act of God. And how can we say that for sure? Look at verse 9 again. Let's read it again. It says, And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. Jesus says, salvation, salvation has come since he is a son of Abraham. Now that word since, if you were to circle it, it means because. He says, he's saying salvation has come because he's the son of Abraham. What he's not saying is that Zacchaeus is now a son of Abraham because he's saved, right? He's saying that Zacchaeus is now saved because he is a son of Abraham. You see, the sonship of Abraham, this is a theme that started way back in Genesis 12, verse 2, when God said, and I will make you, Abram, a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And then a few chapters later, we get a more detailed look. In Genesis 15, verses 5 and 6, and he brought him outside and said, look toward the heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So God's promise is that Abram, who later was called Abraham, would have offspring or sons as numerous as the stars. So here in Luke 19, when Jesus says that salvation has come to Zacchaeus because or since he's a son of Abraham, is he saying that Zacchaeus is a physical descendant of Abraham? No. Although he probably was. I mean, he was a Jewish guy. That's not the point. The sonship of Abraham is a spiritual reality. In Romans 9, verses 6 through 9, we read, But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac your offspring shall be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who were counted as offspring. What this text means is that being born an ethnic Jew as part of ethnic Israel did not make someone part of spiritual Israel, or we may call it true Israel. But the true Israel, the true offspring of Abraham, are the children of the promise. They're the ones God promised to him. These are Abraham's descendants, not by flesh and blood, but by faith, by sharing in the faith of Father Abraham. They proved themselves to be his sons. And these sons were chosen before the foundation of the world. God told Abraham way back in Genesis 15 that his offspring would be as numerous as the stars. And what we learn here in our text this morning is that Zacchaeus was one of those stars. He was chosen as a son of Abraham, as a vessel of mercy, as one of God's elect. So Zacchaeus didn't become a son of Abraham because he was saved, but rather he was saved in time because he was chosen in, past, in eternity past to be a son of Abraham. This is the doctrine of election, okay? 
And like any Calvinist, I could stand up here and talk about it all day, but I'm not going to. Let's keep going. Um, Let's look at verse 10. It says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. If you remember, again, alluding to Luke 15, Jesus is speaking to these great crowds of people, and much like in our text this morning, the, the Pharisees and the scribes are grumbling. They're complaining because all these sinners are coming to Jesus, right? And they were throwing a fit about it. And Jesus responded to them by telling them three parables about finding something that was lost. It was the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and then the prodigal son, or you may call it the lost son, okay? And do you remember the theme of that chapter of Luke 15? The theme, the overarching theme over all those parables is the joy in heaven in salvation. The rejoicing in heaven whenever someone repents. In other words, whenever that which is lost is found. So here in Luke 19, this this isn't a new teaching for us, right? Jesus entered into humanity on a mission to save sinners. But something that needs to be highlighted here that I fear often doesn't is the certainty of it. Because verse 10 does not say that the Son of Man would try to save the lost. Uh, There isn't even a hint of possibility of failure here. And this is important because... Last week we looked at Matthew 121 and we focused, remember on that word save, we talked about sozo, but let's look at that same verse again and focus on a different word. Matthew 121 says, she will bear a son, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Again, the word try is not in the text. It says he will with certainty. Save who? All of humanity? No. It says he will for sure without fail, it is not disputed, will save his people from their sins. Well, who are his people? You can call them the elect. You can call them sons of Abraham. Whatever the case may be, here, Jesus calls them the lost. He says, I came to save, to find and save the lost. And the point is that Jesus has a certain people, and these are the people that he came to save. And there, and there are three things alone that we need to take, or three things that we need to take away from that alone, or that we can. So number one is the assurance of salvation. Uh, if he will save his people from their sins without fail, and we are in Christ this morning, that means that we are and will be saved. There is no falling away from Christ because there is not an iota of a chance that he can fail at saving those that are his. You know, every week before we take communion, we pray a prayer of corporately of confession and assurance as a church. And we are able to have assurance as Christ redeemed because of texts like these, because he will save his people from their sins. So number one is um, the assurance of salvation. Number two from verse 10, we can have confidence in evangelism. Because if he will, with certainty, right, I feel like I'm hammering this, but without fail, save his people from their sins, that means that whenever you and I share the gospel, the results are not up to us. Uh, So what that means is there there isn't any pressure on us to just perform or say everything absolutely perfectly. Uh, We are not on stage and it's not a performance. When we share the gospel, we are to be faithful stewards of the message of the gospel and through that obedience, God will save whom he wills. The only way, church, that we fail in evangelism is when we fail to do it. Failing to open our mouths is failure. But when the gospel goes forth, the results of that are in God's hands. And we can have confidence in that because he will save his people from their sins and because he came to seek and to save the lost. So we can have assurance of salvation, confidence in evangelism. And third, I think one thing we need to take away from this is that we need to reform some of our terminology as believers. And what do I mean by that? Here's what I mean. What do most of us call someone who is not a Jesus follower? We call them lost, right? That's a a household name that we all use. But listen, if Jesus is going to seek and to save the lost, and not every person on earth will be saved, that means categorically that every person on earth can't be lumped into the group Jesus is speaking of here as the lost, because he will find and save the lost. Okay, you with me? So if somebody lives a hundred years, lived to be a hundred years old, and they reject Christ all the days of their lives and they go to hell, it isn't fair to call them lost. Because if they were lost, if they were part of that group, the lost, then according to Luke 19, Christ would have found them and saved them. He says that he will seek and save the lost. So that's not an appropriate term. So if they're not lost, then what are they? They're unbelievers. They are, they are unregenerate. 
Uh, and my point, I know that's a small thing, but words matter. And whenever we apply biblical words in ways that the Bible doesn't, we misrepresent God, whether we mean to or not. And I'll give you another example of this. It's when people call music worship. Music is not worship. It is a means of worship. And, and that gets so conflated. And how many thousands of Christians subconsciously believe that when Josh put his guitar down and I got up here this morning, we ceased worshiping, right? And why do we think that? It's because words have been misapplied for so long that we don't even give them a second thought. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, but not every unbeliever is part of that group, okay? So as we begin to close this morning, what do we take away ultimately from the story of Zacchaeus? I think that the sovereignty of God is a big one, a uh, big, big theme in this story. And I hope that I've made that clear to you this morning. The timing of this meeting between Jesus and Zacchaeus, it was God-ordained. And it went down exactly how God had decreed it to. And the sovereignty of God, honestly, is probably the most comforting doctrine in all of Scripture. Of all the things we could study in our $10 theological words, God being sovereign is where it's at. Um, because what that means, if God is sovereign, is if he is all uh, in control and ultimate and supreme, then that means his promises are true. That means that when we read a text like the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, we can believe it wholeheartedly because God is sovereign. Charles Spurgeon once said, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which the child of God rests his head at night, giving perfect peace. And I can think of nothing more comforting than this truth, that God is in control. So, sovereignty of God is one. Another aspect of this story is the reality that not a single person in this world is beyond saving. Um, Zacchaeus would have been a despised man. He would have been an evil man. This was the type of guy that, honestly, a lot of people wouldn't have given a second thought to. Well, I'm not going to share the gospel with that guy. Like, he is super bad. You know, these people over here are like sort of bad, but he's super bad. There, there are no telling just how many wicked, dark, and depraved things that this man had done in his time as a tax collector. How many families had he abused financially and physically? How many people had their lives ruined as a result of Zacchaeus and his greed? But just like everyone who comes to faith in Christ, we see the grace of God flood this man's heart and he is radically changed. He goes from greedy to giving, from prideful to humble, from hardened to repentant. And this was all a work of God. And the point is that there isn't anything any of us have done that God can't forgive. There isn't any cold, dead life that God can't resurrect. All of us this morning that once were lost have now been found. We are living, breathing testimonies to the resurrecting power of the Spirit of God. So if you're in here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus, what you need to know is that if you will turn from your sin and trust in Him by faith this morning, you will be saved. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And for those of us in here that do know Christ, that are in Christ, I'll leave you with this final thought. When Zacchaeus got saved, the first thing he wanted to do was right his wrongs. He wanted to restore and rebuild everything that he had broken down. Is this true for us today? Uh, are we builders in Christ? Have we sought to reconcile and repair uh, past damage in our lives? And if we haven't, why is that? Where, where is our heart in that? Now, we can't make anybody repent of the wrong that they've done to us, right? Nor can, we, um, nor can we make anyone forgive us when we repent of the wrong that we've done to them. And there's no doubt that even after paying all these people back, some of them would have still hated his guts, right? Thank you for all this money, but I still hate you. I can't forgive you because of what you've done. But that didn't stop Zacchaeus from seeking to do the right thing anyway. And there are people waving the banner of Christ today all over the place who are on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. They claim Christ, who is the great ultimate reconciler, while simultaneously sowing nothing but discord and division, even among the body of Christ. In Philippians 2, 2, Paul says, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, and being in full accord. And I'm going to give you the, the TDV, the Travis Drum version, of Philippians 2, 2. Cut it out and get along. That's what Paul is saying. If we are truly in Christ, we are all playing for the same team, regardless of what building we meet in on Sunday morning. And beyond that, the people in your lives ought to know that you're a believer first. And if they do, they ought to see that there's something different about you, the way that you handle yourself, the way that you relate to people. We as Christians should be a people that are quick to forgive when someone seeks forgiveness, and we ought to be quick to repent when we've sinned against someone else. Amen? We see that in Zacchaeus. Let it be true for us today. Would you uh, stand with me this morning and we'll pray.